I'd like to introduce uh, Chairman John Rocky Barrett from the Citizen Potawatomi Nation. Thank you. Thank you, Ian, uh, for that uh, remembering that you were born the year I took office. It's, uh, I, you know, once you get past 70, you really don't really don't feel any differently than you did when you're like 35. And I was coming down on the elevator quite early this morning before the Honoring Nations event. The young lady who was checking out, uh, in, in her 20s, I guess, uh, pulling a bag and carrying another bag. And as the door opened, uh, I stepped up to try to hold the door so that she could get her bags out and uh, she was struggling with the one she was carrying and the one she was dragging so I reached out and I said here you go and extended my arm and she set her bags down and took my arm and said let me help you <laughs> <laughs> oh. Oh. so not exactly the chick magnet anymore you know, so. But what I'd like to do to describe uh, uh, how our constitutional revision came about is to give you a description of what things were like prior to uh, 1985, uh, during the period which uh, I served as vice chairman for two terms in the 70s, and I was the tribal administrator for the tribe for several years in the early 80s. We had an Oklahoma Indian Welfare Act. Constitution, which was the uh, stepchild of the IRA. It had all of the disadvantages of the IRA and uh, none of the advantages. But the, we had, at the time, an 11,000 member tribe. We had a quorum for general counsel of 50. And during the 1970s, we would have so much trouble getting a quorum that we would recess the meeting after it was convened, all get in our cars and go force our cousins to get in the car so we could make the 50 person quorum and then sit by the door to keep them from leaving in order to have a tribal election. Because our meetings had descended into a combination of uh, uh, conflict, uh, violence, uh, it, it, I mean, uh, interfamily enmity. My mother was a BIA agency kid. My grandfather was uh, employed by the agency as the BIA police, and she and her nine brothers and sisters, uh, then they were marshals, she and her nine brothers and sisters grew up on the agency, which is the grounds where the tribe is now. And most of the rivalries between the 40 families that make up our present 31,000 member tribe go back to where my grandpa didn't like your grandpa, and though, so I don't like you. Uh, it, it, it's that far back and that unreasonable. But we'd have a general council meeting, finally get our 50-person quorum, and we'd finally get kicked off about 2 o'clock. Now, mind you, this is when we had a borrowed trailer from the BIA for a tribal headquarters, $500 in the bank. We'd have to borrow a place to meet. And we didn't own anything, we didn't have any businesses, we weren't doing this tribal government, we were meeting once a quarter to do enrollments, and very little else going on, but we could find something to fight about for at least four hours. <laughs> so right about six o'clock or 6.30, the low blood sugar would kick in, and then it would really get down to it. And most times it would end up with someone having to call the police or whatever. It was, to borrow H.L. Mencken's description of democracy, the circus run from inside the monkey cage. <laughs> it was not government. It was a family reunion gone bad. And uh, this whole breaking bad business that went on in our tribal government, uh, the idea that the general council, the, the, which was a, a meeting of the tribe itself, would be the supreme governing body of the tribe implies that our culturally, that Potawatomi's allowed anyone of any age over 18 to stand and at length speak their, speak their mind uh, about any matter uh, in council without any deference being made to age or experience 
uh, or a, in, in any way, shape, or form recognizing uh, any of those rules that were part of our tradition. Uh, in, in days of old, if you were an 18-year-old and you stood in council to speak, your grandfather would snatch you down and stand and apologize for you getting up to speak without the permission of your elders. So we had this unbelievably dysfunctional form of government, and we were two-year staggered terms of office, five-member business committee, and we were reinventing the wheel every 24 months. And uh, every year there would be some kind of change where anyone that you were doing business with would say, well, what happened to old Bill? Oh, he got thrown out, and uh, you know, somebody's in, in his place, and uh, well, does that person know what was going on? Well, no, but the, the sad part about it was it not being government, it, it inhibited our ability to operate as a government, to operate successfully operate enterprises, to do any kind of economic development, to do virtually anything as a tribe. We were, at the time, uh, starting out with a 900 square mile reservation we purchased in 1867 in Oklahoma after the forced relocation from Indiana to Kansas and then 30 years later into Oklahoma. The Allotment Act had taken us down to uh, a, a very small amount of acreage in, in the hundreds of thousands of acres. And then in 1904, the Bureau of Indian Affairs in Oklahoma, through the agencies, determined that if you kept your land in trust at the Shawnee Agency, you could be deemed without a hearing and with no recourse by the agency superintendent to be incompetent to conduct your own affairs, which included contracts, leases, checking accounts, and so on. So that the pressure to take your land out of trust was huge. And so most of the land of the Citizen Potawatomi individual allotments went out of trust. And when I say most, down to about 6,000 acres. The land held in common by the tribe, however, went down to two and one half acres out of 900 square miles. We owned one little bitty piece of land in Sacred Heart that was the old council house site, and that was the total land held in common by the tribe, virtually landless. And there was nothing we could do about it. So we decided in 1985, after a violent takeover of the tribal headquarters that ended a uh, general council meeting and uh, an armed confrontation in the intercession of the Bureau of BIA police, we finally, there was enough outrage of the membership out in the, and we were a blood degree tribe uh, at the time. Uh, we had an enrollment blood degree requirement. And there was finally enough outrage at that behavior uh, out and about that we got the things started to get a constitutional revision. And in that 1985 revision, we approved absentee ballot voting and we redefined what the general council was. Rather than the general council being an annual meeting on the last Saturday in June at a site selected by the business committee, it became, the general council became defi defined as everyone in the tribe over 18 years of age, basically the electorate uh, within the tribe. So once the general council was redefined as the electorate, then actions of the general council required a referendum vote of the people. And uh, that could be resolved by both in-person and absentee balloting. This was a huge step. We also established at that time a tribal court. Prior to that, we had the CFR court. And uh, the CFR court was extremely limited in its jurisdiction and, and its uh, statutes. We did not have a tribal code. We did not have a tribal court. In our opinion, the definition of government requires the willingness to adopt laws and enforce them as a government. So we, we adopted a tribal court, and once we had the absentee ballot, it suddenly dawned on us, one third of us still live in Oklahoma, and because of the 1950s Bureau of Indian Affairs Relocation Program, in World War II and the oil booms in Southern California and all and the Dust Bowl and all the other reasons 
We had two thirds of our people that did not live in Oklahoma and one third of our people who did. So we decided to take the government to the people and we began having what we call regional council meetings in various cities around the United States where we had population within driving range of more than 2,000. If we were a California tribe, counting our northern and southern California populations, we would be the largest California tribe. We have uh, you know, close to 6,000 members in California because of the relocation there. So we started holding these general council meetings, Denver, Phoenix, Kansas City, Dallas, Houston, uh, uh, the Los Angeles area, Sacramento area, Portland, uh, SeaTac area in Washington State, uh, and various places around the country, and we would bring the government to the people. And in most cases, <coughs> they were at least two generations removed from Shawnee, Oklahoma, and in some cases, four generations removed. So they had very little knowledge of the language, the culture, the government, or anything about it. <coughs> These meetings were well attended because we would rent a room like this at a hotel and set up a table full of food and eat and then present uh, some audio visuals and dance and drum a little bit and sing and talk about everyone's families. And it was a well attended uh, event, and, and, but we did learn something that if you put food on the table at a meeting of the citizen Potawatomis, they will not fight. So the next time that we had a general council in Shawnee, instead of sitting in rows, like we are today, we sat in round tables with big piled up sandwich trays and various things to eat. We didn't have a single crossword. So it was low blood sugar, I guess, that was uh, causing most of our governmental disruption. So after we began the regional councils, we started promising people that that form of activity would be permanent in a new constitutional revision once that area took on the vestiges of self-governance. And so from 1985 until 2007, we actually began the process, the final revision of our constitution in 2001. Uh, once and we started submitting it to the Bureau of Indian Affairs, the Bureau of Indian Affairs spent three and a half years rejecting each form of government that we submitted uh, with the Bureau, the director of the program that was then improving constitutions when I asked her, don't you feel bad about not being able to vote in your elections at home? And she said, I could care less. So there was a lot of resistance from the Bureau to change tribal constitutions until uh, Chief Ross Wimmer became uh, <coughs> Assistant Secretary. So we got the people accustomed to meeting with the government by having these regional council meetings. And they weren't authorized in the Constitution. We just did that on, uh, on, on executive authority as the chairman. But what our court took on was an in persona jurisdiction. Our court was created with a law that said that the laws of the Potawatomi tribe applied to all members of the tribe wherever they live because citizenship in the citizen Potawatomi nation is consensual. You can withdraw your membership from the nation and therefore the court jurisdiction applies to you wherever you live because you have consented by virtue of being a citizen in the tribe to the jurisdiction of the court. So we felt like it was incumbent on the tribal government to take the government to the people. And to take that a little further, in 1991, we amended our enrollment from blood degree to uh, descendancy. Uh, the 10 largest tribes in the United States, nine are uh, based on descendancy enrollment. And we did it primarily because the Bureau of Indian Affairs had made such a chaos of our blood degree uh, requirement. We had parents with lesser blood degree than children. We had uh, uh, 3,000 blood degree appeals uh, pending at central office at BIA. Our blood degrees were established originally by a single government employee in a log cabin at Sugar Creek, Kansas, who in the census of 1867 assessed people's blood degree by what his perception was of their skin color as they came through the door. 
So if you worked outside that summer and had a good tan, you got more blood degree than your parents. And that blood degree determinations are still there. And so we just gave up on it. So we enrolled by descendancy. That took our enrollment from approximately 12,000 to approximately 25,000. And we also amended our age from 21 to 18. So in 2007, after years and years of regional council meetings and preparing our people for self-governance in each one of the districts and having them participate in tribal elections for over, well over uh, two decades, uh, we finally did as we had promised and we allowed them to elect representation from uh, uh, all over, all 50 states in the United States. And uh, we have the good fortune, I do, of having our district representative from the state of Texas, Mr. Bob Whistler, who is in the audience today. If you could raise your hand, Bob. Um, we divided the country up into Oklahoma and all the rest of the states and in 2,500 member districts. And we were in a quandary. How do you, how do you work it out where two-thirds of the population is outside of Oklahoma and one-third is inside of Oklahoma and all the adults can vote? How do you keep them just saying, well, let's sell all that stuff in Oklahoma because I don't go down there? Well, what we decided to do was to give weighting in the representation of the legislature to the population by having eight people from Oklahoma and eight people from outside of Oklahoma. Well, that doesn't sound, that's an intentional tie. That doesn't sound really fair, but of the eight from inside of Oklahoma, Three of them that were the executive branch embedded in the legislature are elected by the entire United States. So the two-thirds majority of the tribe could elect the members of the executive who were also part of the eight from inside of Oklahoma. The condition being that even though they were voted upon by every member in the country, they had to be residents of the state of Oklahoma and part of that 8-8 eight, eight tie that would force us to compromise over issues in state and out of state. So the new legislature, uh, and we created in each one of those districts a district office, and we installed teleconferencing equipment, and the legislature became virtual. It meets by teleconferencing equipment, except for one meeting a year when we all come together at our annual general council. And the teleconferencing equipment or the system is not used just for legislative purposes, but for cultural purposes, for regular uh, information exchange, and for various other uh, activities of the, of the tribal legislature. We also did something uh, that I think is absolutely necessary. Most tribal courts, and all courts, three minutes? Wow, I got through that pretty quick. Uh, most tribal courts will try to narrow the issue is, is down as far as possible as courts are prone to do before they'll hear an issue. So we granted the constitutional authority for the tribal court to hear a dispute between the executive branch and the legislative branch <coughs> on a constitutionality, either of an act of the legislature or an act of the executive without a cause of action. Before something bad happens, the courts can rule on constitutionality. And we have precluded those bloodbaths that take place in the disputes between uh, legislative and executive. The other thing we did was make it absolutely clear, bright line, between the legislative authority and executive authority. The legislature can't answer the phone. It speaks and acts by resolution or ordinance only. The executive branch does not spend money unless it is appropriated for specific purposes by the legislature. So control of the purse strings is in the hands of the legislature. The running of the tribe is in the hands of the executive. And the separately, independently elected judiciary has the ability to do constitutionality determinations without a cause of action. So far, it works. And we have survived uh, a, a number of things. We broadcast our meetings of the legislature over the teleconferencing equipment over the internet. So if you want to attend a meeting of the Citizen Potawatomi Nation legislature, 
go to potawatomi.org and you will be able to see uh, our legislature in action. So um, that's how we did it. So far it is uh, working. And what has been the result of that is we have had 20% growth in assets every year for 20 years. And we currently went from $500 in the bank and two and a half acres of land held in common to a $553 million economic impact annually uh, in our local economy. We own the largest chain of tribally owned national banks in the United States, the largest uh, tribally owned native CDFI. Uh, we are, have as much commerce that is non-gaming as we do gaming. And uh, we are furnishing 2,000 college scholarships a semester, uh, annual college scholarship in excess of 6,500. And we furnish free prescriptions to everyone in the tribe over 62 uh, by mail order from our pharmacies. And we provide uh, closing costs and down payment on home loans, we do not do per capita payments. So that's it. Thank you for your time. Got questions?